This map shows where we started here in Nebraska and flew across Ohio up into New England and then across and had to hit this little dot in the middle of the ocean called the Azor Islands owned by Portugal and from there to Casablanca across North Africa to Italy. Then our airfields were right around the town of Foggia and so we would fly out of Foggia up into this area of Europe, uh, Germany, Austria, Romania, and, and so forth. So at that point I was assigned to the 15th Air Force, the 463rd Bombardment Group, the 772nd Bombardment Squadron. On my first mission, I mentioned that I went to Novi Sad, Yugoslavia. <clears throat> well, <laughs> everything seemed to be the same in training and going up there until we got over the target and anti-aircraft began bursting around us and out between our number one and two engine, here was a big burst of anti-aircraft. And I thought to myself, what? What? Oh, oh, this is what it's all about. I got a load of bombs for him, and he's got some anti-aircraft for me. And so, so for the first time, we kind of took seriously, you know, these kids out of college had learned to fly and have fun and all of that, and, you know, we're going to be the big hot pilot. <laughs> all of a sudden, we found out what it was all about. A few weeks later, I was assigned to fly to Vienna to the night before the mission, I, I, I was scared. I, I, I really was scared. I wasn't sleeping too well. And uh, I decided that, uh, you know, if all else fails, try prayer. And uh, so I started praying. And uh, how long I prayed, I don't know. But all of a sudden, I had the sense of a white glowing light in the tent. We, we, we lived in, in Italy, we lived in tents. And glowing and getting bigger, and all of a sudden I relaxed. I said, everything's going to be okay. And I carried that all the way through. And it was helpful because we had some, some pretty rough missions and, and, and that. but. Uh, uh, that, that, that was a thing, very vivid in my memory. Well, th there, there was one mission that uh, was pretty indelible uh, in our minds uh, when we finished it. Um, and it started out just like uh, any other mission, uh, taking off, forming up, flying up the, the sea, crossed uh, into Germany. We were headed to an oil refinery at uh, Blackhammer oil refinery in Germany. And <clears throat> uh, I mentioned our uh, group commander, uh, Colonel Kurtz. Uh, well, he, I guess you say he was one of these uh, real raw, raw, hit the target boys. And uh, he instilled that into all of his lead uh, people. And so <clears throat> as we're in the target area, and we had been warned there, there could be some bad weather, and uh, particularly uh, the big, I guess what we probably call a thunderhead, or you see a cloud with an anvil top, real black, very tall. They, they can get to 30, 40,000 feet. Well, <clears throat> in those cumulonimbus clouds, there's air circulation, and in the center it's going up, the outside it's rolling up and coming down. And as you pass from one to the other, it's, it's a shear force of uh, several hundred miles an hour difference in that. And uh, when you're flying, you do everything possible you can to avoid them in that. We say it's like flying into a brick wall uh, that, uh, when, to do it. Well, as we start down the bomb run, 
Here's big old Thunderhead setting right in line. And we didn't know coming whether it was on the target, before the target, after the target, and that. Well, I guess that the lead uh, bombardier, he was looking down and that, whatever. Anyway, it was a tie. And as we dropped the bombs, we entered the Thunderhead. And the next thing we knew, and whether it was an illusion or not, the plane is going down and the bombs are going up. And I get control of the plane, get out of it, get the level flight and look around. We didn't see another plane. We didn't know where we were, where others were, to, to form up, because we're up over enemy territory. And, then, and, and so uh, you're, you're not supposed to break radio silence when you're uh, up uh, like that. And, and so we said, well, I guess the best thing to do is head home. Well, if you're up over Germany and you've flown out of Italy, where's Italy? South. Well, it isn't exactly south. What's south is the Alps. And if you've ever been in Munich, you can see the Alps there. And so as we came out of that area, not knowing just how long we had and everything, why we wanted to conserve fuel and that, and so we set up a rather slow descent going down, 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 and uh, entered some clouds and that. And uh, in a little while, over the intercom comes the shout, pull up. Well, I reached down, I pulled up, I reached over. <clears throat> B-17s had, and most of them had superchargers on the underside of the plane here. And they were very powerful to increase your power but you're never supposed to turn them on real fast. They, they might explode. Well, I just reached over and I spun it just as hard as I could, pulled the thing back, and we shot up. And the guys in the waist looked out and were flying straight up a mountainside, brush on either side. And when we got back to the base, <clears throat> There was mud on the ball turret and stuff like that. So all of a sudden we found that what was south of the target was the Alps. And we had flown right down into the Alps, flew up, and headed back. Then we had a little better idea of where we were geographically. And so we took more of a southeast uh, heading. And <clears throat> after a little while, we, we had radio compasses, which we could tune in a radio station, and we began getting this great American high, uh, big band uh, music and that, and say, hey, we're home. So we're homing in on that, and pretty soon we get anti-aircraft fire. Well, <laughs> pretty soon the station identifies itself as with the armed forces in the front lines of northern Italy, Fifth Army. Well, we were still north of the line, so we were over enemy territory <laughs> yet. So, again, now we knew where we were. <laughs> so we headed out to the coast. And again, by this time, I'm telling the guys, we're out over the water. Dump your guns. Dump anything you can. Open the windows. Throw everything out you can. <laughs> we, we need to have as much... Uh, lightweight, uh, less weight as we can, and that. And so <clears throat> we're making our way down the coast, and, and after a while, we come across the spur, turn inland, which we didn't used to doing, call the airfield, call the tower, permission to land. Who are you? Who'd you say you are? What's your code? You can tell him. Permission denied. <laughs> I said, that's your problem. That's not my problem. I'm landing. <laughs> so I come in, landed, 
turned off to the areas where, where the parking areas were pulled, and the props died. We were out of gas. I, I entered the time in the planes log, time log, 11 hours and, and something, and that, and uh, went to the mission and debriefed uh, there, and uh, told him, he said, no, no, that, that, that story doesn't hold up. No B-17 with the load that you had could have gone to that target at that altitude and back without gassing up. Now, where'd you land? Where'd you land? <laughs> so, again, that's your problem. But they refused to give me credit for the hours on that mission. And, and so my mission record shows nine hours, which is the longest by a few minutes of, of any of the missions. But my own personal log shows over 10 hours on it. But <clears throat> when I got done, I got the guys together and I said, OK, which one of you yelled pull up? And not one of them said they yelled it. They heard it, but not one of them would say they held up. So what I've told my friends, when I get to heaven, St. Pete, I've got a question. <laughs> now, I want to know <laughs> who yelled pull up.